Hi, uh, welcome back from our coffee break. I want to just thank everybody uh, once again for being here. Um, definitely want to thank our sponsors, LinkedIn and DMUX, who are uh, kindly providing the um, funding for our evening event, which is at Jungle Bird. Um, I don't remember the address, but it's very close by, so please join us. 174 8th. Uh, we'll all walk together as a group after the, uh, after the event. 18th and 19th. Between 18th and 19th. All right, great. Yeah, and I'd like to uh, introduce our next speaker, um, Brian Viber from the Wikimedia Foundation. He's a lead software architect, and he'll be talking about nearly native alternative cooks in HTML video. Thank you, Brian. Hello. Ah. Turning it on helps. OK. Uh, so hello, everybody. Um, as introduced, I'm Brian Viber from Wikimedia Foundation. Uh, can you hear me OK, first of all? OK, good. Uh, we're a tech nonprofit best known for running Wikipedia, uh, which is everybody's favorite free online editable encyclopedia. Uh, I've been involved since pretty early on, back in uh, 2001, 2002. Uh, and served as our first CTO during our early expansion and scale-up days. And uh, now, among other things, I do research improving our support for multimedia upload and playback. Uh, so a little background. Uh, Wikipedia started in 2001 adopting uh, wiki style and open source principles following the more limited success of the somewhat more structured Newpedia encyclopedia project. Uh, our goal was to create a freely redistributable, multilingual online encyclopedia that could be quickly written, edited, and improved by the public, not just by a small number of academics. Uh, and from these goals came our various policies on the use of things like file formats for media uploads, copyright, patent, blah, blah, blah. Uh, in fact, our original license uh, used for content was the, the GNU Free Documentation License, which very explicitly requires a transparent editing format, which must itself be free and open. This proved to be very difficult for multimedia, where public domain material is often available in final compressed form only. Uh, later, we switched to Creative Commons licenses, which are a little less strict in this regard, uh, but we kept our rule that, open for, uh, that file formats be open, implemented by free software and free patent encumbrances. Uh, because in theory, it mattered to us that everyone, regardless of which software platform they used, be able to uh, access our data. I mean, that seems like a good idea, right? So in 2001, 2002, 2003, this felt pretty easy. It meant things like use ping instead of GIF. OK, you know, that's, that's not too bad. It's just a different file format. It's still pretty popular or maybe use Wave or Og Vorbis instead of MP3. Eh, OK, you know, Wave is easy. Og was a little funky, but it was popular enough in those days that you could manage it. Uh, a lot of software did support it. Uh, both GIF and MP3 were eventually added when the patents expired, but that was only very recently for MP3. Uh, getting MP3s in 2018 sounds a little late to the party. Uh, now, around the time we started supporting video content as well, uh, this was about the time that the Opera browser proposed the HTML5 video element, uh, which was originally proposed to use the Augfiora uh, open codec as a minimum baseline that every browser would support. Um, now, Mozilla was happy with this. Google implemented it, but uh, wouldn't really commit to everything. Uh, and as many of you know, uh, Microsoft and Apple in particular were not really on board with Fiora and were promoting H.264. Uh, in those days, we also supported some player plugins. So, you know, it was a anything goes kind of era. Now, for better or worse, there was no standard agreed on in HTML5. So you have HTML5 video. But no one really knew which codec to use. OK, most things supported H.264. Uh, even Mozilla ended up supporting it with uh, some indirect ways to make it work on Linux, which was uh, the most complex problem. Ah, those are sad days. Now, in 2014, uh, we were hoping to ramp up some more video projects and really get some multimedia stuff going. 
uh, and we tried to do a uh, community call for, uh, uh, sorry, request for comments process uh, proposing uh, use of H.264 as an alternative format or a secondary format uh, or as a co-primary format along with WebM and AUG. Uh, it turned out, unfortunately, um, that we weren't able to get that to go through. A lot of our uh, community was you know, still not really uh, happy with the license situation on the patents, and it ended up just, just not going through. Uh, so, although we do carry a fair amount of video data, uh, most of it public domain uh, or Creative Commons uh, sourced from uh, varieties of other archives or uh, original material that uh, is mostly clip, clip form, uh, we haven't really deployed the kinds of tools that our users would really want to have video be a first-class citizen in an online editable encyclopedia. We don't have a video editor. We don't have uh, you know, a, a really video forward anything. It's just right, it's, it's there if you look, find it every once in a while. Now, you know, that's not great, but it's okay. Wikipedia is a place where eventualism runs out, or wins out. If we know that we want to reach a goal, but we don't yet have the resources to push to it, we know we'll get there eventually, even if we're missing something for now. And consistent video support is no exception. But before we can get video editing and animation tools to our users, we have to make sure playback works. As a backup plan to improve playback compatibility for uh, browsers that did not adopt the open formats, uh, namely Internet Explorer at the time, uh, Edge when it came into being, and Safari, uh, I revived a research project I'd started to decompress Ogfiora video and Vorbis audio in JavaScript using the Imscripten compiler to convert the C codec libraries to JavaScript. It ended up working well enough to provide a fallback mode player for IE and Safari. Hey, pretty cool. Uh, and this is called OGVJS. So how does it work? Uh, well, there's lots of little bits. Um, but they, they all fit together. The first, of course, is Imscripten, uh, the compiler. That's the most complex and fortunately is mostly maintained by other people. Uh, but it's a really great system. It uses the LLVM Clang compiler to compile your C or C++ uh, down to bit code uh, and then turn that into either optimized JavaScript code or more recently WebAssembly, uh, which is an optimized subset of code uh, for JavaScript virtual machines and other embedded environments. Uh, browsers have gotten really good at optimizing this, uh, especially since WebAssembly came about. And performance in modern browsers can be within about two times of native compiled code, depending on the specific code. Uh, 2x, though, comes with a lot of caveats, which we'll get into shortly. Uh, also, if you're stuck on Internet Explorer, that was frozen a few years ago, and it's really slow. So if you're using Internet Explorer 11, please stop. Um, now, to actually put together the parts that compile into JavaScript from C, uh, I use standard open source DMuxer and codec libraries. Uh, Ziff's libaug, libvorbis, theora, and opus. Uh, libvpx from Google. Uh, Mozilla's nestag for WebM demuxing. Uh, and more recently, I've integrated Videoland's uh, David encoder or decoder for AV1, uh, which is still a little experimental, but uh, works pretty nice. Uh, on the top, there's a JavaScript layer which fetches chunks of the source file through H XML HTTP request, feeds them into the demuxer to get packets, and then feeds the packets through the codex to get the raw YUV frames and audio sample buffers. So it just sort of loops down and then back up into uh, the higher level areas. Uh, YUV frames are drawn onto an HTML5 canvas using WebGL, if available, to offload YUV to RGB conversion to the GPU. Uh, which is really nice because uh, you can actually reach really high frame rates, 60 FIPS or more, uh, even at high resolutions. Uh, if WebGL is not available, conversion is done on the CPU, uh, which is a lot slower, but still works for relatively small videos. Uh, in the early days, it was somewhat tricky to get audio to work, but with uh, web audio, uh, it turned out to be pretty tractable. Uh, there's also a flash shim for IE, which works, uh, but is not the best thing. Uh, the YUV canvas output 
and the audio feeder abstraction uh, using either Web Audio or Flash are both available for reuse as NPM modules, uh, as is the chunk streaming file fetcher. Now, in the middle, we have uh, the main JS player code, uh, which actually imitates the API of an HTML video element. Once created, you can drop it into your DOM, you put it wherever you would, size it, style it, and it just works. You call play, you set source, whatever. Um, it's a somewhat older version of the standard right now and doesn't support things like MSE, but that is planned for the future. Uh, and it's relatively easy to take this and dump it into front-end code that expects a video element, such as the Kaltura or VideoJS players or whatever kind of front-end and custom controls you have. Uh, you just drop this in instead of a video element, and boom, it works. Now, an obvious question you're probably all thinking of is performance. How well does this actually work? Now, our original uh, deployment was for Og Fiora, uh, and it worked pretty darn great. Uh, Fiora is a relatively simple codec. It doesn't use uh, a whole lot of SIMD extensions. Um, and I was ab able to very easily hit high definition video, uh, 720 and 1080 uh, on a reasonably fast machine. Uh, slower machines might have to bump down a resolution, but generally, you know, pretty much everything worked. Unfortunately, the bandwidth required for good quality Fiora was a lot higher than even our Web MVT VP8 versions. Uh, which we were also creating for the modern browsers that supported VP8. Uh, but most importantly, there was a huge maintenance burden of continuing to use Theora uh, after it had been largely abandoned for WebM by other free software users. Uh, we had a lot of bugs. We encountered you know, little things where it would break under certain conditions, uh, and we would have crashes and have to chase things down and patch things that were no longer being maintained. Uh, so. We actually switched to fully VP9. Uh, and it turns out that VP9, of course, is a bit more complex to decode. Uh, so we actually had to drop resolution slightly. Uh, on a fast machine like this nice little MacBook, uh, you can very comfortably hit 720p on uh, VP9 decoding on the CPU, even single-threaded. Um, but on a slower machine, you might have to drop to 480 or even a little bit lower on some uh, lower-end machines. Not as great as you would like, but it serves well enough for our purposes for the encyclopedia for now. Uh, VP9 and Opus are also supported natively by current versions of Edge, which means uh, that we're basically just serving Safari and legacy IE 11 users with the shim now. So what are some outstanding issues in the browsers uh, that make this difficult uh, and would improve our lives and simplify things for us. Uh, we can roughly divide this into three areas. First, universal AV1 and Opus support, which would need for the shim to begin with. Secondly, uh, low-level improvements to WebAssembly to improve performance. And thirdly, low-level and mid-level video features to improve its feature set uh, to let us a little more aggressively use the native parts of the browser. So at this point, every browser maker is part of the Alliance for Open Video although we're still kind of waiting for Apple to actually announce support for AV1 in Safari. Uh, until that comes, uh, we definitely need the shim because not only is Safari Safari, Safari is every browser on iOS. Mm -hmm. Firefox on iOS is Safari. Chrome on, Fire on iOS is Safari. Everything is Safari. So we kind of need it there. But even with AV1 everywhere, uh, this sort of play playback tech would still be useful for legacy files uh, and for some kinds of video processing. For instance, frame accurate compositing, frame extraction, transcoding in the browser, et cetera. Uh, these things are very difficult to do right now. You uh, can only specify a seek duration in you know, kind of weird floating point units. It's hard to do anything frame accurate. Uh, and when you're combining multiple videos, uh, such as you might want to do in an editor that has real-time previews, um, everything's very complex to get timing right. So down to WebAssembly. There are two big places where we lose performance big time right now, and that's the lack of threading and the lack of SIMD. Both of these are being actively worked on in the WebAssembly community and by the browsers. Uh, the world of JavaScript 
is single-threaded today. You can run code on separate threads with workers, but they have their own JavaScript world, which makes it hard to share data except through message passing on the event loop. C-style threaded code, such as you'll find in libvpx's vp90 coder, requires shared memory. But the JavaScript shared array buffer feature was disabled by browsers as a specter mitigation, and only Chromium has brought it back so far. Two-way or four-way threading helps tiled VP9 decoding quite a bit, so I'm looking forward to this being available widely. But even within a single thread, uh, you want to be able to work on multiple items at once uh, through SIMD instructions. Single instruction, multiple data. Uh, stock web assembly is like a traditional ISA, like, you know, old 386 or, you know, some old RISC or something, uh, in that you can basically only exercise the plain C code paths of your decoder. You get none of the assembly, you get none of the vector intrinsics that you might have, none of it's there. There is, however, an experimental SIMD extension to WebAssembly, which doesn't expose every native feature because that's really hard to do portably across processors, but it uh, does export a fairly decent subset of common operations, uh, which are portable across Intel and ARM and theoretically other common CPUs. Uh, and it has been implemented in Chrome. Uh, so I've actually done some testing using uh, the David uh, AV1 decoder, and uh, even porting just a few of the biggest hotspots, I found a 70% speed boost in decoding. Uh, that's total decoding time versus uh, just the time of the filters. So uh, there's a lot of headroom still uh, to cut down on that, and uh, there will be further improvements uh, based on when Chrome fixes a couple of bugs that are still outstanding. Now, assuming that all these changes go through with the browser makers, uh, the combination of threading and SIMD will make signif significant performance improvements for codecs and other custom video processing. Anytime you're working with pixels, you want to do as much as you can at once. Speaking of pixels, let's get pixels back on the screen. What can we do to a video element to get data in and pixels and sound out regardless of a source codec? Now, what we really want is a native video element that can accept a queue of uncompressed YUV frames and audio sample buffers and play them for us with all the native features. AV synchronization, do that for me. Screensaver suppression, oh, please do that for me. Full screen, picture in picture, speed and volume control, I want all this stuff to work. And uh, right now, I, I have to jump through a lot of hoops to do AV synchronization. Full screen mostly works. The screensaver suppression, though, as far as I can tell, there is no way to do it in the browser uh, except through an actual active video element. Now, I have made uh, two research spikes uh, in this direction, hoping to uh, get something sort of working. The first is based on MediaStream, which is usually associated with WebRTC. Uh, this is very promising. But it does have some limitations because it is oriented around real-time AV streams, uh, while our main use case is flat files that have a beginning and an end. So by combining a video element with a media stream, uh, we can actually uh, get our canvas data and our web audio data into a video. That's pretty cool, right? OK. So uh, we still have to create a canvas, though. We just keep it off screen. Uh, and it turns out that the canvas has a capture stream method, which lets you create a media stream of whatever it is you're putting on your canvas. Wow, that's exactly what I want. So let's set up one of those, create a media stream with our video track. Uh, but we also wanted the audio in there, because we want to make sure that if you hit the mute button, it actually mutes. Uh, OK, so it turns out that audio context has a method called create media stream destination which creates a media stream and lets you hook up elements uh, in your web audio context to that, and that creates you a media stream with an audio track. And lo and behold, you can create another media stream that just combines the audio track with the video track, and now you've got what you actually need. Uh, you plunk it into the video's source element, poof, magically you've got video. So this resolves several of my chief complaints about using Canvas. 
screen saver or screen dimming uh, is prevented during playback. So you're no longer you know, sitting there you know, on your phone or your laptop and you get two minutes into the video and the screen goes dim. You know, that's, that's not a good experience. Full screen works, picture in picture even works uh, in browsers that support it. Uh, and it's fairly straightforward to hook up pause and play and such forth to uh, work pretty reliably. Uh, however, the full controls aren't there. If you enable the browser controls for the video, uh, it won't give you a seek bar because it doesn't know there's a beginning and end. It thinks you're viewing a live stream. It's also unfortunately very buggy in Safari. Uh, in particular, on desktop, audio doesn't work, which is not good. And on iOS, video doesn't work. It turns out that they both work in the iOS simulator. But unfortunately, most people do not spend their time in the iOS simulator. Uh, the bugs have been filed, both in WebKit, Bugzilla, and in Radar. Uh, and I'm hoping that they'll get fixed during the Safari 13 beta cycle. Uh, but there's no guarantee that it'll happen. So I'm just kind of waiting and seeing. And uh, hopefully, it'll work. Uh, also, some of the APIs required are missing in Edge. Uh, so it doesn't work in Edge right now. But in Edge, we have native VP9 in Opus, so we're not immediately running to use it there. Uh, it also does work in the Chromium-based Edge, uh, which is the new version uh, coming out sometime next year. Uh, and of course, you can test it right now, and it does work. So I am experimenting with this, uh, integrating it into OGVJS shim itself, but I'm just not ready to deploy it until it works on Safari. And I have one other method. Wouldn't it be nicer if you could just queue up frames and buffers and let the browser's AV stack deal with timing and display? Well, you know, media source extension just does something kind of like that. Uh, it lets you feed in muxed data streams full of video and audio and deals with playback details as long as you keep feeding more data in. It's exactly what I want for output, but for input, it needs data in compressed format that it already understands. However, there are ways. I borrowed an idea from a suggestion made at a previous conference talk to look into Ben Missender's uh, blog post, The World's Smallest H.264 Encoder, which creates packets using the H.264 uncompressed IPCM mode. Each macro block is raw YUV data with no compression, not even a DCT. Uh, so you just take your macro block data from the YUV frames, you put in 16 by 16 pixels of uh, of Luma data, and then eight by eight pixels of Chroma data, eight by eight pixels of the other Chroma data, and then you go on to the next macro block. It's really fast to compress, but obviously it doesn't compress. But you know, it's in memory, so who cares? Uh, so I went ahead, I ported that code to JavaScript and extended it to support some higher resolutions. Uh, and combined it with VideoJS's MuxJS to generate in-memory fragmented MP4 stream chunks uh, using the uncompressed frames created by the uh, custom codecs from OGVJS. Um, on the left, we have our video frames. Uh, on the right, uh, I've implemented audio using uh, FLAC, uh, which it turns out you can also create a FLAC stream that's entirely uncompressed, uh, so it's very cheap to encode as well. Uh, and it doesn't use nearly as much memory as the video, so you know who cares about compressing that? And it comes so close to working. Um, there are a number of pain points. The first uh, is with audio. I got the FLAC uh, in MP4 encoder working in Firefox and Chrome. But Safari doesn't actually seem to support FLAC, despite advertising support in uh, media source is type supported. You straight up ask it, do you support FLAC in MP4? And it says, yes, go ahead, play it. And you feed it the data, and nothing works. <laughs> oh, well. Uh, however, it does work with uh, Apple's similar ALAC format. Uh, so I may add that in, uh, in the future. It's been open sourced as well. Uh, and there is available code and documentation for it. So it eh, should be possible. But there's a much bigger problem. Uh, which is the buffer sizes of dealing with that uncompressed video. Uncompressed YUV frames get quite large at high resolutions. Uh, a single frame at 1080p weighs in around three megabytes uh, at uh, 420. And especially in Firefox, uh, MSC has really strict buffer limits. Um, you can only 
commit uh, a 16 megabyte buffer at a time in Firefox. That's not a lot of frames. That's like eight frames. Uh, and you can only store about 100 megabytes total in uh, the media source uh, total buffer at any given time, and then you have to trim more data out. Now, that sounds bad, uh, but it's actually not that bad, because uh, all your data is already buffered at a higher level from the original compressed data. So all we have to uh, put into the uncompressed data is a couple seconds at a time. So, you know, you, you can work with that. But there's a bigger problem, uh, which is the constraints on the H.264 profiles. Uh, it turns out, uh, after doing quite a bit of research on why this wasn't working on every browser, that uh, basic and high profile both specify a minimum compression ratio. If you have uncompressed data, your compression ratio is one. That's not gonna work when the minimum compression ratio is two. So, uh, turns out that's a problem, uh, and different decoders implement these restrictions in different ways, so it's not even consistent. Uh, it turned out that pretty much everything on my Macs would take any resolution I threw at it up to 1080. I haven't tried anything bigger than 1080 because it decodes too slowly. Um, but uh, on my Windows PCs, I could only go up to uh, 4, uh, 480, there we go, 480, and then anything 720 and above would pfft, nothing. And on ARM systems, uh, whether Android, iPad OS beta, or even Windows 10, nothing. No frame size, literally no frame size would show. Uh, which I'm pretty sure is due to the uh, decoder cores in the ARM systems being very strict about applying these limits. That's sad. Now, if that's... If that's the case, um, there's not really a good way around it for this exact technique of abusing H.264 as an uncompressed format. But that's okay. We can probably find some other way if we can get the browser makers to adjust the APIs. Uh, it should be possible to deal with uncompressed YUV or RGBA frames. Uh, in fact, the browsers are already doing it for the media stream case, uh, because when you take the canvas capture stream, it's doing exactly that. It's creating RGBA frames out of the canvas and feeding those over to the video. So it's definitely possible to process them. It's simply a matter of getting them into the system with a uh, suitable API. Now, another possible API uh, or one possible API, is to use a common uh, muxing format like MP4 as a layer for, you know, shoving the uh, data into buffers and then allow registration of custom codec callbacks to transform the demux samples into raw output, which then goes off to uh, be played. Uh, this would basically add a extension point for JavaScript or WebAssembly code to uh, inject itself into the decoding pipeline. Uh, a few years back, there was actually an experimental patch for Firefox which added a similar system. Uh, it was a little more limited uh, in that it was um, synchronous, uh, so it had to run on the main thread, which is really not where you want to do your custom codecs. Uh, and uh, over time, it fell out of date, but I, I was able to make an experimental version uh, using actually OpenH264 uh, as a temporary proof of concept uh, compiled with Imscripten, just to make sure that I could do something that would produce YUV frames. And uh, it did work. Uh, a similar API today would want to use um, asynchronous APIs, obviously, uh, so that you can do your work off main thread, which gets uh, a little more complex, but you know, we pretty much need, know how to do that with promises and workers and worklets and all these fun things. So that would be useful, obviously, for custom codecs, uh, which you might use for license or legacy reasons, but could also be used for other things, graphics art projects, uh, frame accurate compositing of multiple video streams, uh, by creating a codec that actually merges several bits of data together or generate something procedurally or what have you. So 
Another API that I would like to steal because I actually really like it is on uh, native iOS code. There's something called the AV sample buffer display layer, uh, which is a very long name to write, and I have typed it wrong many times in the past. Uh, but it's a very useful little class. Uh, as its name says, it's a UI layer which displays frames from sample buffers provided to it. Uh, and it has a really great property, which is that it accepts samples in either compressed form, as from a typical network stream or file, or uncompressed form, as they might come from a camera or, hey, a custom codec. Demuxing, if applicable, is left to the caller, and audio can be handled by the similar AV sample buffer audio renderer, and you can synchronize the two of them uh, to get AV sync going. So one possible solution uh, is to add a similar sample by sample API to MSE's source buffer object, or create a relative of source buffer that's specific to unmoxed sample buffers. Uh, sample buffers could be represented as an object that wraps one or more array buffer providers, uh, one for each plane for planar YUV formats, or uh, a simple buffer for um, uh, grayscale or audio. Oops, there we go. And uh, this is just a little bit of potential sample code where you, know, you might just append buffer by buffer, uh, and you would be able to use uh, whatever the uh, API for the actual buffers is in your low-level code as well as your high-level code. So if the browser makers don't go for something that's oriented around sample buffers, uh, an alternative is to use uh, fragmented MP4, again, as a muxing layer, but explicitly support uncompressed frames and audio contained therein, instead of uh, faking it with a compressed format as I was experimenting with H.264 or uh, registering a custom handler. Uh, you just create your frames and append them. Uh, I believe this may require using QuickTime flavored files rather than ISO flavored files. I'm not 100% sure on uh, the details of marking codecs for uncompressed stuff. Uh, but I'm fairly certain it would work in a reasonably sane fashion, and I don't think it would complicate the uh, muxer or demuxers, et cetera, too much. Uh, although it may, uh, of course, increase pressure on buffer sizes, which could be exciting. So, some related features. Uh, other things that I would like in there include frame by frame or buffer by buffer decompression and compression. This would be very helpful for editing, compositing, things like that. Uh, you can use the Media Recorder API uh, to compress something from a media stream, but it works only on live media streams, so it can't run faster than real time and it can't run slower than real time, which means it's limited to not being able to run as fast as you might like, and it's limited to not being able to take the time to make high quality video, which is kind of sad. Uh, and of course, extracting frames by drawing them to a canvas uh, is not always frame accurate, and uh, also it does the YUV to RGB conversion for you and doesn't give you access to the underlying YUV data, which you might want to do uh, slightly more accurate. Uh, manipulation of the data. So being able to transcode with a lot more control would also be useful when dealing with user submitted files that might need to be streamlined for faster upload. These days everybody's got a you know, phone that does you know, 4K, oops, super high resolution uh, recording and you don't actually always need that. So being able to take whatever was on device and then say, okay, let's make that a little smaller and then upload it would be so nice. So, closing up. Uh, big things that would be great. Universal AV1 and Opus support. That would help our particular use case a lot by letting us uh, reduce the use of the shim to just older legacy browsers. Uh, but it would still be useful for uh, other things where you, you're using legacy file formats uh, that don't have transcodes available. Um, Media stream provides some of the features that I want for native feeling video, uh, but not all of them. As long as you work with uh, custom controls, it works pretty well, um, because you can provide then your own seek bar uh, and uh, uh, playback rate control and things like that that don't work on the live stream natively. 
Uh, I would really love some extensions for uncompressed video on media source extensions. That uh, is kind of double extensions. That's cool. And uh, I'm hoping to find a good combination of use cases and clean APIs that browser makers would be willing to implement. So if you happen to be or know a browser maker who is interested in these sorts of things, by all means, come talk to me at some point, and uh, I would love to talk your ear off about this. Um, and I think that's mainly it, and we're open for questions. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much for being here, Brian. Um, we have one question from the audience here, and Anonymous has asked, do you see Web GPU being a better alternative to WebGL in the future? Possibly. Uh, Web GPU is very exciting uh, because you can do more low-level stuff with less latency. Right now, the only WebG, uh, WebGL that I'm actively using uh, for this is for the final blitting of uh, the, the uh, YUV data to an RGB canvas. Uh, so that's not as performance sensitive because it's you know one rectangle and three textures. Um, but even there, uh, you would be able to, for instance, run things from off-thread uh, in WebGPU, which would be nice. You could uh, pre-render the um, RGB conversion and then blit it to screen, uh, all kinds of things. There's also potential for using more parallelism based on the GPU uh, for various things. Uh, among others, I think there was some talk of GPU acceleration for AV1s noise filter uh, or film grain reconstruction, I believe, uh, was one that was proposed. And that's something where you would, again, want to be able to use that. Uh, so definitely, I am following WebGPU, but unfortunately, it doesn't apply as much to the actual codex at this point. Great. Uh, and then one other question we had was, do you worry about using all the CPU for this work and preventing <laughs> the browser from, from other work happening within the browser? Sorry. I absolutely do. <laughs> uh, the good news is most of the heavy work is off main thread. Um, so even without the full threading support for WebAssembly, we are able to run the entire WebAssembly module as a unit in its own worker. Uh, so uh, currently, uh, OGBJS actually runs three threads. Uh, so the first is the main thread where it does demuxing and drawing and network. Uh, and then there are worker threads for video decoding and audio decoding. So you are still using up a whole bunch of CPU, uh, but it is at least in the background. And as long as you have two CPUs uh, at least, which even your phone does these days, um, it's not eating up too much. Uh, but it does use power, which I'm actually a little more concerned about. Um, it would be nicer to use native uh, stuff as much as possible, just because uh, your phone will last longer and not heat up as much. Great. Do we have any questions from the crowd? Yeah, at the front here, Preston. Uh, hey, Brian. Uh, you mentioned that VP9, decoding VP9 is more difficult, uh, and you said even on a modern um, computer CPU, you can only do 720p60. Uh, do you really mean it's a native decoder or it's a JavaScript-based decoder? So it is um, WebAssembly, or there are two builds. There's JavaScript if you don't have WebAssembly, and there's WebAssembly if you do have it. Um, and the WebAssembly build uh, is significantly faster than the JavaScript one, but it's not as fast as a full native build would be. Okay, so you mean the 720p60 is not for the native uh, so 720p30 is more like what we're seeing on most machines. Uh, and that's for the web assembly. Okay, but for the native? Yeah, for the native, you can do significantly better. Okay, gotcha. So the, uh, the main performance things that are still kind of bogging down uh, the web assembly version are lack of SIMD and the limitation to a single thread. Uh, so if I can do two threads and SIMD, that will basically quadruple the decode speed. And that will be really nice. Fantastic. All right.
Thank you so much for being here. I'd like everybody to uh, thank Brian for being here today. Thank you. Thank you.